start recording. Okay, you yeah. gotta have to hit, click okay for the record button. I did. All I right, did. Sweet. All right, sweet. Then we're recording. All right, well, good. We finally got you. Yep. <laughs> All right, let me unplug this. I got another microphone plugged in. Let me unplug my other microphone. Okay, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm all excited and honored to be a guest on your YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, well, you're world famous. Everybody is going to know you. All right, let me, <laughs> let me get, my, uh, get my lights ready. I don't like the light to be too bright on top. It accentuates my bald head, so. And <laughs> yeah, there's no good place, they say, for the light. Anyways, um, all right, well, um, we got some questions for you. Okay. Uh, the first question for you is, let's say a person has a big competition of some endurance type competition. Let's say it's just a five mile race, not necessarily a marathon. What do you think is the best yeah. workout meal? I prefer going lean, mean, and clean. I don't eat before races. <laughs> not at all? Well, I, that's because the race is in the morning, huh? Right. Yeah, they're normally at 7 a.m. sometime, like a marathon. Here mm -hmm. in the Honolulu Marathon is 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And if, if you've been eating the right diet, a whole food, plant-based, vegan diet, your mm -hmm. glycogen stores are topped off. You've mm -hmm. heard of carbo-loading. That's, yeah, yeah. that's what I do every single day. Mm -hmm. And so the glycogen stores usually will last uh, a couple of hours. And so that's... Uh, with the right diet, that's what you can do. Not yeah, eat yeah. clean and mean. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like basically, I eat what I would call the OMAD diet, one meal a day diet. Just because I work oh. a lot in the daytime, I come home, I eat a big dinner, and I'm fine till dinner the next day. Glycogen in the liver um, functions quite adequately to maintain blood sugar for 24 hours, and to some extent for 48 hours. Um, so it's 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 pretty easy to eat once every two days, even. However to have maximal energy before, uh, let's say a heavy workout, lifting weights, like high repetition squats. I like to guzzle about 32 ounces of beet juice and chase it down with 16 ounces of water about an hour and a half, two hours before. I found that really energizes me. Um, do you ever have competitions that are like shorter distances where you might do that? Or let's say an afternoon competition where you might do that. Do you ever, or do you ever take that into consideration? I've never had an afternoon competition. <laughs> yeah, marathons and triathlons are morning things. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Do you eat during the competitions? Uh, the Ironman triathlon, I at the aid stations, I will usually grab something. I also pack bananas on the back seat of my bike saddle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you so. just have bananas during the race, during the competition, typically, and, and water? And whatever they had at the aid station, they're normally fruit, which mm -hmm. I would grab also. Like Gatorade even, or did you have Gatorade or any of that kind of stuff? Mostly water. Water's nature's perfect beverage, and that's what you need. So I don't think you're losing fruit? that much in electrolytes in, in that short of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read the Olympic you know, marathon champs back around 1970. They didn't even drink anything. They didn't drink or eat anything. You didn't know what you were supposed to drink. I remember those days. <laughs> okay. I started uh, running, uh, Dr. Rogers, I started running in 1968. Huh. And <laughs> yeah, when I read Kenneth Cooper's book, in fact... <laughs> that's the old copy 1968 just happened to see that on a newsstand and i'd never heard that word before not surprising since he had just coined it uh and i read thumb through it and thought oh this is interesting so i bought it and read it and put on my tennis shoes the next morning and went out for a run and uh, i've been hooked ever since so yeah, I also remember you saying one time that in your experience, you hadn't seen any runners um, develop Alzheimer's. Was, was, is that still pretty accurate? Yeah, um, that would involve a long-term study, tracking longitudinal study. You know, you take this group and follow them for yeah. 30 years. I'm just saying in your personal experience, I'm not asking, you know, did you do a research data and precisely check it? Because it's been my yeah. experience too. I ran cross country my senior year in high school 
And the cross country uh, members of the team, they had the highest SAT scores of any of the kids in my high school. I think running makes people smarter. It does. Yep. Yeah. BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor. It just pumps up the brain and your neurons start firing and working. So in terms of Alzheimer's, uh, diet and exercise is the best thing you can do. And I think uh, Dr. Dean Ornish is doing research on dementia. And the last time I talked to him, he said, we're getting ready to publish. And I know that's what they're going to say. Yeah, I mean, it does a lot of good things. Like you're saying, it it increases brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor. It increases neurogenesis. It actually increases uh, mitochondrial um, biogenesis. You make more mitochondria. It also does something called glycogen supercompensation. You store more glycogen in the astrocytes, which are there to help out the neurons. So all those things support the brain. You get more angiogenesis formation of healthy, good blood vessels to increase blood supply to the brain. I think it comes down to when an animal encounters a new environment, it must memorize that environment quickly and figure it out in order to survive. So movement makes us smart. And like yeah. and Voltaire had asked, why do animals have brains, but plants do not? Because an animal moves. Moves, it's, right. Yeah. <laughs> like the yeah. sea squirt, its brain reabsorbs and it's adult. You know, sea squirt's life story? When a sea squirt is a, uh, a juvenile, it swims and it has a brain. As an adult, it attaches to a rock and becomes a filter feeder and its brain reabsorbs. So uh, what the body doesn't need, it abs absorbs, including bones and muscles. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we're seeing an epidemic of is sarcopenia and osteoporosis and dementia. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Because I noticed, like I have friends, internal medicine doctors, they tell me, Every single one of their patients over 60 is cognitively slow. You're still cognitively fast. And so I think it's, you know, your healthy diet and your exercise, it's kept you sharp, you know? Well, <laughs> hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, I'd also say something. You had an interesting story one time. You had talked about you were riding your bicycle and you got hit by a car and you had a femur fracture, if I remember correctly. It was a truck and I've been hit twice. <laughs> Yeah, twice. Uh, the first time was training for my first Ironman. And I was, uh, you know, it's a 112 mile bike ride. And I was coming up on uh, about 98 miles. And the next thing I knew, I'm in a hospital bed saying, what happened? Where am I? And the nurse started laughing she said you've been asking that question for many many times and i and then i started to move and oh my god the pain was just horrible what happened was a truck clipped me and i hit the ground my helmet they showed it to me in the hospital two halves and they said had you not had this on you would have been killed for sure i also had a, a hip fracture and a leg fracture. And and uh, Dr. Frank Farron was the Ironman uh, medical director. And he happened to be on ER duty at the time. And so he was following me. And then when I totally regained my senses, I said, the Ironman is in seven weeks. I'm, I've got to heal by then. He, he said, I think you better forget it because there's no way you're going to heal from all this by then. And I, I said, oh, no, I'm going to. No, no, forget it. Long story short, as I come up on the finish line of the Iron Man, Dr. Farron is there and he's shaking his head. He said, if I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe it. Okay, so it's let me- It's the diet, it's- I know, the... well, this is an important point because I'm always talking to people about trying to heal things. And that's an yep. extraordinary recovery. Yes, um, it is. About how yep. old were you at that time? Uh, uh, 50, wait, four, 50. You were yeah, 50 I, years I old? I was diagnosed at uh, 47 with the breast cancer. And I did my first Ironman at 49. And so, yeah, I was 49. You were 49 at the time of this accident when you had the fracture? Yeah, the, and the first Ironman. And I, I've had done a, uh, five of them since. Okay, yeah. you had a hip fracture, is that correct? Is that a femur yeah. fracture? Well, the second one was a tibial fracture tibial and it fracture. was shattered, comminuted fracture. 
Okay. And it was a similar thing, training on my bike mm -hmm. and coming up a hill. Mm -hmm. And here's a truck coming down mm -hmm. with a load of kitchen cabinets. And he's looking to the right for his street sign uh -huh. to turn. And mm -hmm. he sees Seventh Avenue and he turns and T-bones me on mm -hmm. the bike. Mm -hmm. And that's what... Uh, Comminuted fracture of the tibial. Yeah, yeah. Usually, comminuted fracture is very difficult to heal. And so, yeah. what I'm yep. wondering, because I recalled you saying you used to eat like two big bowls of salad a day. Is that about right? Um, yeah. You might even say I have leafy greens three times a day. Three times a yeah. day. Yeah. I yeah, do eat greens. What type of yeah. type of greens were they? Do you think you're eating at that time? Uh, kale. I've always loved kale and cilantro. Uh, Swiss chard, any of any the greens. Any uh, of the greens. Uh, we grow a lot of watercress here in Hawaii, so I was getting that too. Leafy yeah, green. Gosh. Because that kind of echoes back to like what Esselstyn's been saying for about the last seven or eight years. He's recommending people eat a little bit of greens every day, all day long. And I think yep. the gist of it is, you know, they have the precursor nitrates, the back of the tongue makes them into mm -hmm. nitrites, go to the stomach, nitric oxide. And he thinks yep. that if you're doing it a little bit all day, almost like grazing, like a herbivore animal, that you're you're constantly keeping high nitric oxide levels systemically to optimize perfusion of your entire body. Yep. And he feels that that is significantly coronary protective, but that would also ideally optimize oxygen delivery to the fracture site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what they did uh, from the ER, and they transferred me to the orthopedic ward. Uh, mm -hmm. because I was going to have to have uh, either in a wheelchair for six weeks if mm -hmm. I was going to let it heal, or he said, I can put a tibial rod in there and mm -hmm. get you weight bearing right away. Mm -hmm. And what a horrible choice to have to make. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't know which way to go. I kept going back and forth, back and forth. And so uh, the, the surgeon said, okay, uh, decide and then uh, he left he came in then the next morning and he said okay what are we going to do and i said oh, i don't know and i had actually called dr mcdougall mm -hmm. and you know who uh, uh god dr harris is uh the scientific basis of vegetarianism bill harris actually i don't okay he's he's the author of that book and he was one of us my mentors, and uh, he couldn't tell me either uh, which way to go. He said, it, it's a horrible choice to have to make. So that night, still in the orthopedic ward, surgeon comes back in, he says, okay, what are you gonna do? And I said, and let me talk to one more doctor. And uh, he said, okay, and he walked away. And about half an hour later, a nurse walks in and, uh, she says, what are you doing? And you know, in the orthopedic ward, they have these monkey bars. I was pulling myself up, trying to keep my muscles. And she laughed and she said, oh, okay. And she puts some papers on the, the tray, walks out. I said, wait a minute, what, 15. what are those? And she said, sign them, walked out. And so I thought, well, Am I going to refuse that or am I going to bite the bullet? So I bit the bullet because sitting in a wheelchair waiting for the bones to knit and still not be sure how the displacement, all those bone particles, it really bothered me. So I have still have that tibial rod in my leg with two screws mm -hmm. and probably several more. Yeah, I get it. I am rod with interlocking screws. Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with that. Okay, but still, it's still extraordinary that you were back running so soon. Yeah. And you also. Well, I was, they scheduled me for physical therapy uh, mm -hmm. three times a week. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of the hospital, I paid for the two other Tuesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it, the PT place is, is walking distance. So mm -hmm. I would walk to PT and get more PT five days a week PT. And, mm -hmm. and I was sure that helped plus my diet, of course, mm -hmm. sleep is important. <laughs> you know, can't, yeah. can't, yeah. So. Yeah. You sleep better too. When you sort of keep everything natural and you get a lot of exercise as well. 
Because yep. yep. th that's a key point, you know, for good healing. So I think that's part of it, eating a lot of greens, getting your sleep. And also you had a positive goal. I don't know. You ever heard of Maxwell Malt? Um, yeah. He, yep. yeah, he yep. wrote a lot about the post-op um, outcomes and the patients who had a specific goal. You wanted to compete. They're just so much more motivated and it helps the healing process. He said they just get better faster when the person has a specific goal. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people, they just sit in bed. Oh, I'm in pain. I'm in pain. Give me pain meds. They get constipated and they get pneumonias and they don't do so well. So. Yeah, that reminds me. I, I'm very competitive and that's why I love racing. Do you see all the trophies behind me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. I know you, you've set records and won tons and tons of uh, marathons and uh, triathlons. Yeah, yeah. And, you and, see that golden shoe there? Run, yes. you know, Runner's World Magazine, a runner of the year. It was one of the neatest awards I've ever gotten. <laughs> so well, that's great. Yeah, you're an inspiration to all these patients. Well, let me tell you about how I got into racing. Um, I I told you, went out and ran what turned out to be a mile that first time after reading aerobics by Dr. Kenneth Cooper. And so I just kept it up. And I would run for an hour before going to work. And I worked at Hickam Air Force Base. I was a logistics officer and I had a group of four uh, young airmen. Uh, one was a captain and the others were sergeants. And they, I told them about running and all this. And one day, one of them handed me a flyer and he said, they've got a, a race here, 5K. You ought to enter it. And I said, oh, oh yeah, what a great idea. So. I sent in my entry and, and at seven o'clock that this at particular Sunday morning, I arrive at the racing and I look around and there are all these young, fit military Air Force guys. And I thought, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous. I had and I was about ready to slink away when the gun goes off and it was run or be trampled. And I thought, Oh my God. <laughs> and I was out of breath by the first hundred yards. And I thought, oh, oh, what? And I, I thought, I've got to keep going. And I'm the only female. And I, I, yeah, they're all going to look at me and say, women shouldn't be in races. And this was back in 1970, and back when women and mostly men didn't even run. You know, the running boom didn't start until later, the mid 70s, late late seventies. And so I thought, I have, I can't quit. I've got to keep. And I slowed down a little trying to keep my breath and kept going and kept going. And finally, finally I see the finish line and I cross it and oh, oh and I looked around. I wasn't even last. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, oh thank goodness. And got some water and then I heard my name. And I walked up and I got my first trophy and uh, that's it. <laughs> you know, where's another race? You know? <laughs> and so I got up to uh, the record I got was when I was 64 years old, I had done 64 races and I was not done yet. And that's when that second uh, uh, car or truck hit me the one with kitchen cabinets and common nude fracture. So um, I slowed down with the racing and uh, the Dr. Bill Harris that I mentioned uh, said, you know, biking is not your friend. He said, it's too dangerous. Look what it's done to your life. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. I always had a stationary bike. In fact, that's how I healed. As soon as I could get on the bike, both times I would do the stationary bike. And so that's, uh, that pretty much ended my road racing. It, it is dangerous. And every time I see someone on a bike or a motorcycle, moped, I think, oh, please wear a helmet. And I think about the two halves of my helmet, so. Yeah. yeah. Also, this video, we might only have a couple more minutes. So if it if it ends, can I just send you another link to do a second half? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. The next question for you is, as far as like the diet, what do you think is the best diet for a patient? You know, recovering from cancer. Uh, do you think they should be 100% raw? Would you think they should eat beans? Do you think they should? What do you recommend? I think both work. 
I've done a hundred percent raw and I've done the, the beans and uh, I, I think they both work. It depends on, I don't know. Do you know who uh, Dr. Doug Graham is? Yeah, 80, 10, 10. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I wrote the foreword to that book. <laughs> you know, if you because I um anyway, that works. It would work for a cancer patient, but I also follow Dr. Michael Greger's nutritionfacts.org. And uh I think if you can get a patient to do either one, what I've found when I've seen in the REACH recovery program that some of the hospitals have. Uh, where they have volunteer breast cancer patients like me visit a newly uh, diagnosed and surgically removed their breasts in the hospital, they reach recovery and I go visit them and tell them. And I would tell them about the diet. And uh, the most common response I got was, I could never give up my cheese. You know, and Neil Barnard wrote the book, The Cheese Trap. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, I didn't find it hard because I had that uh, <laughs> typical medical gun to my head. Dr. McDougall said, change your diet or die. You know, it made it so clear. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I went home and told my then husband that I was going vegan, no meat, no cheese, no dairy. He said, that's ridiculous. You've fallen into the hands of a quack. That's stupid. Oh my God. And anyway, that's uh, part of that's in my first book, A Race for Life, where I talk about uh, what I didn't know then was mm -hmm. the diet I was on for my breast cancer would have cured his high blood pressure, his... I hate to say it, ED. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we. I had no idea that the same diet was for everything, and I, and of course, this was back in 1982 when uh, I didn't know a lot about. I was about to learn, and uh, working on my PhD, I was all but the dissertation on my PhD in psychology. And when I found out that if I want to help people. I can do, in fact, Dr. McDougall said the same thing. Uh, you can help far more people with the diet. So I switched majors and got my PhD, the dissertation on the, the role of diet and exercise in a healthy lifestyle. And so, uh, and that was back in 1990. And I've been trying to <laughs> convince people, give up the cheese. Your life is not worth it. And when I, and oh, people say, are you ever tempted? And I say, I look at a piece of dead animal on a plate and wonder how people can eat it. It's just repulsive to me. And dairy, my gosh. And I say, isn't it about time you got weaned? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. The more you learn about it, the better. So if I understand you correctly, you did the McDougal diet initially and you got great results. Your cancer didn't, pr didn't progress. And then you later changed to a, uh, like a raw diet, largely fruits. Is that about right? 30 years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Mostly fruit. And then, uh, I guess, uh, I was losing weight and I didn't know why. And so I thought, well, I better add some beans. And, uh, then I read about the blue zones, you know, mm -hmm. about the blue zones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, and they're uh, the Okinawans. And I had been courtesy of the Air Force. I was flown out to, to deal, do an exercise uh, and saw the Okinawans and their 90% purple sweet potatoes. So um, I eat those now. You know what a crock pot is? <laughs> like, a, like a cooking pot, you know? Slow, slow cooker. Yeah. And yeah. I get uh, a 19 pound box of purple sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. And I chop them up and fill up the crock pot and mm -hmm. cook it for about three hours. Mm -hmm. And every night, that's the main starch that I eat. It's the start of my supper. And then I yeah. add veggies. And then my dessert is always fruit. Usually fresh pineapple, which, you know, we are still growing here mm -hmm. in Hawaii. And the dessert is just fine. Sweets. 
uh, uh, the fruit plenty sweet. Yeah, I, I think sweet potato is the best food in the whole world because it has oh, only one percent fat and it has only four and a half percent protein. So that's actually what you want is very low in protein and fat, very high in complex carbohydrates. It's perfect. Plus, being a potato, it's it's got almost complete nutrients. So it's I think it's the best food in the world. Like look at the Papua New Guinea; they get ninety three percent of their calories from sweet potatoes, and they're very fit and strong despite the fact they smoke a lot. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Let me see. I got another question here for you. Okay. So we talked about how to improve healing pre-workout meal. Um, we talked about cancer diet. You got any other general advice for people? You know, that, what do you think are like the most important things for the audience to know? The three pillars of health, good food, good exercise and good sleep. And at first it may, may call for discipline. I mean, when anytime you're making a major habit change, uh, it takes some discipline. But look at the rewards. The rewards are so great. And I think that's why I keep getting on my website, ruthhydrick.com, I get questions from people looking for the motivation and uh, answering their questions that frequently their doctors raise, think, oh, you, you need the animal protein because uh, plants aren't a complete protein. You know, that myth still pervades, unfortunately, this big push on protein. They don't know that uh, animal protein puts your kidneys into hyperfiltration. And that's why we've got dialysis centers popping up all over. People are doing this to their kidneys. And nephrologists don't know this. Isn't that sad? They, yeah, that's been my experience too. Nephrologists, they really don't know much about how to protect the kidney. Diabetic doctors, they don't know anything about diabetes. It's the truth. Oh. I've met with them. They don't know. They don't know the basic papers of diabetes. And the nephrologists, you know, they're very nice. They know the dialysis mean machine backwards and forwards, but they don't know how the relationship between diet and kidneys. They don't know Dr. Kempner, for example. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's really sad. And it, it's destroying our environment. We could get into that, too. You know, uh, had you ever been to Hawaii and Lahaina? Yes, many years ago, I was in Hawaii. Yeah, it was a beautiful place. Yeah. And look what climate change has done. The wildfires, not just destroying the whole village of Lahaina, one of the most idyllic places on earth, if you've ever been there. It's just wonderful. But we've got wildfires all over. And if we don't quit destroying the rainforest, what we do to raise food, to feed cows, to feed people, to make them sick, and ruin the environment. It it just makes no sense whatsoever. So that that would be my parting shot. It it's good for the health. It's good for the animals, and it's good for the environment. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's a win all around. It's good too. And I also think too, one of the things that happens to a person naturally in the process of you know competing is you have to train a lot. In a sense too, you simplify your life. And you, I, I, for example, I'm also uh, very interested in toxicology. I've read quite a bit about it. I think without even realizing it, most Americans expose themselves to tons of toxins. And it's it's just, 30. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have the, remi talk? the reminder to get me to stand up. We've been sitting too long. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I see we're still recording. I don't know when my time runs out. Maybe I think I get about one hour. Um, and then, then there's a limit to what, how much time you get. Cause I have a free account with this, uh, zoom pro zoom thing. Okay. Do you, do you have any other things you can think like you would like to tell young people, like you would tell people about health. Cause you know what it's like, you know, the people got a lot of questions and the big things was, Ooh, running out of time. It says for unlimited meeting. Uh, no, I don't want to upgrade. I have to, I don't want to, I don't want that. I don't know You're how much left. time. 52 seconds. So. Time. Oh, we got no, we got nine minutes and 49 seconds. Oh, so we got some yeah. significant amount of time. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, then, young people, I, I all, when I see a young person, nice and slim and well developed, I want to go up to them and shake them by the shoulder and say, if you want to keep that beautiful body, you got to feed it the right fuel. And I look at fat ones and I want to do the same thing. You know what that fat in your belly is doing to your body oh it's making you sick 
Yeah. How do we get this message to more people? Yeah. People don't understand it. And doctors don't either. They're trained, match the old of the pill and send a bill. And it's yep. not even on their, it's not even on their radar, their consciousness that diet and toxicology are the most important thing. So yeah. it's very difficult, you know, for them to, to respond to that. And then the patients are clueless. I mean, typical patient, it's, they're eating a terrible diet and they just think it's normal. Oh, gee, everybody in their family's fat and sick. It must be genetic. No, it's because y'all eat the same thing. Uh, yeah. So that's, that, that's been a difficult part of it. That, that And there's no money in it. You know, I do it because I know it's the right thing and it really helps people. But um, do you have anything else you would tell like a cancer patient? What would you tell them would be the fastest way to optimize their odds of having good long-term survival? The diet. Uh, T. Colin Campbell in his book, The China Study, proves mm -hmm. that uh, animal protein is like a light switch. And I would tell a patient, animal protein is an on switch for your cancer. And by withdrawing that animal protein, it, it, the light switch goes off. And I show that with what I did, no chemo, no radiation, mm -hmm. despite the tumor being five centimeters. That's big, really big that was with no, 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 clear, no clear margins. Yeah, so at, without chemo, because Dr. McDougall was, was doing the research and that's how I met him. I heard about him doing research on diet and breast cancer. And mm -hmm. he said, that's a condition. The first time I met him, the condition is no chemo, no radiation, because if I know the diet's going to work. Mm -hmm. And when it does, they'll say, oh, it was the chemo, or the radiation. So you must refuse chemo and radiation. Mm -hmm. And of course, the oncologist thought that was risking my life. And why would I follow that advice? So initially it was, do I listen to Dr. McDougall or do I listen to my oncologist? You know, what turned out is that my oncologist, he's sitting there at this desk with this fat belly. And uh, turns out a year later, he had a heart attack and died, age 45. Mm -hmm. So sad, you know, doctors don't even know how to take care of themselves. So I would tell patients, uh, I, I can't give medical advice, but I tell newly diagnosed patients what I did. No chemo, no radiation, made the diet 100% and exercise because we know that when you exercise the large skeletal muscles, you're producing myokines, which is an enzyme, which they have recently found out suppresses cancer growth. This was shown with prostate cancer. And you know, prostate cancer is also hormone, hormone derivative cancer so as well as breast cancer so I think that's what helped me because I had run a bunch of marathons in 1982 when I was diagnosed in fact I remember telling Dr. Me I can't have cancer because I run marathons and he said it's your diet so yeah I, I think I think it was a diet as well um yep. oh, yeah and then it, things all come together synergistically and the exercise you know you you put yourself in the, what's called the MPK pathway and that's sort of the opposite of mTOR, and it sort of shuts off cell replication. You get the lymphatics to contract, and you, your white blood cells can surveil the entire body much more effectively. You get a 10 to 30-fold increase in lymphatic fluid movement, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was the first vegan to ever do the Ironman triathlon. You know, that's a 2.4-mile swim in the ocean and a 112-mile bike, and then you run a 26.2 mar marathon. So in 1984, the very first vegan to do the Ironman. And just to make sure it wasn't just a, an odd coincidence, I uh, did qualify, of course, for the next year. So I did the next one. And then Continental Airlines contacted me and said, you know, if they have an Ironman in New Zealand, how about we sponsor you? <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. So they flew me first class, covered everything, including uh, the media the next morning. Uh, New Zealand Herald, one paper in New Zealand, headlines, front page, Ruth, a woman of iron and my picture. Mm -hmm. And I came back and I threw that on the Continental Airlines agent. And he looked at that and he said, don't they have an Iron Man coming up in Japan a few months from now? And I thought, I just did Iron Man in October. Here's another one in March. And this one, 
And I thought, well, if I, what do I, if I can't fail, they're, they're just going to fire me. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Kept right on training. No recovery. That's the other thing I discovered with the diet. Fast recovery. And got another first place in Japan and did a fourth Ironman uh, in October. Four in a year. So it's a lot, yeah. Yeah, and people, I think they still say it takes, they definitely said it takes a whole year to recover, but not when you're eating the right diet. So, yeah, that's great. Um, what we could do, we got about three and a half minutes. If you want, we could do another one, another recording session. And then the second session, if you would like, we could talk about breast implants and all that, you know, that topic. Okay. Yep. So that'd be yeah. a separate video. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because I don't want to. <laughs> dilute the message with right what's... right they're two separate different things yeah. they're two totally yeah. different issues okay. yes um well another thing i would say that was part of your recovery it seems to me is because I, I i interact with a lot of people is a lot of people without realizing it i think they expose themselves to a lot of chemicals that are harmful um by that i mean you know there's the whole story about deodorant increasing the risk of breast cancer um, aluminum yeah the aluminum and the preservatives, power benzoic acid typically, and then they shave first, increasing transdermal absorption, shared lymphatic yeah. between the breast and the axilla, the armpit. So yep. I think that adds up. Plus also a lot of these, almost every personal care product has estrogenic preservatives. Um, it's just because they tend to have a long shelf life and they're antimicrobial to prevent mold growth such that they put them in everything. Um, yeah. So what I think is helpful is to be a minimalist. And what I'm saying here is, I think that you were kind of a minimalist without necessarily intending to be just simply because you were so busy training, you didn't, yeah. you weren't like sitting around working with a bunch of toxic chemicals and putting all this stuff on yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I always had said, I'm a low maintenance. I don't go to beauty shops. I don't wear nail polish and all this stuff. And uh, it turns out that that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think that's relevant. And I think there's also something that very few people know about. There's something called Circa. Circa is sarcoplasm endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. What that means is every cell, it's got an organelle inside of it. Typically a cell has an endoplasmic reticulum, a muscle cell, heart muscle or skeletal muscle, smooth muscle. They have, a, they have what is called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the point is it's a reservoir of calcium. And this enzyme, the calcium ATPase, pumps calcium into that reservoir. And what I'm saying is a lot of these cleaning chemicals, fingernails, chemicals, paints, adhesives, and glues, they all inhibit circa and they, in so doing, they disrupt calcium metabolism. And that's actually kind of a big deal because it causes fatigue. And it's similar to the effect of excessive dietary sodium. Excessive dietary sodium leads to excessive uh, cytoplasm calcium, and it causes all kinds of misactivation of cells all over the body. And one of the things that it does, it causes uh, increased platelet activation, making the platelets more prothrombotic. And what that, what that leads to is when you have hyperthrombotic platelets, they have a tendency to cover metastasizing cells in the blood and they encircle them and they hide them from the immune system. So the risk of metastatic disease goes significantly up. And so by avoiding just chemicals in general and not adding salt to one's food, one decreases the risk of metastatic cancer in that way. Um, that's good to know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so Circa, Circa is an interesting thing. Okay, we've got less than a minute. All right, any, anything else to say for this video? <laughs> no, just that reinforce the these pillars of health i mean that's if you want to know more nutritionfacts.org look at the research the science is there it's so clear so, also yeah at your at your site too they can go to your site again what was that ruthhydrates.com yeah yeah they can check that out okay that sounds great all right um i've got a whole bunch of lectures on cancer at my youtube channel as well uh, but uh, and the and the one in Hawaii that was that was actually I think a good lecture because it, it forced me to keep it concise. It's only an hour.